You know, it almost gets to the point, as a wrestling fan, I dread going on social media or the internet sometimes because I have that fear as a wrestling fan of who's going to be next. Who's going to be the next name, legend, icon from the past, from my childhood, that's going to leave this world far too soon. And unfortunately today, as I got off work and got back home and got onto social media, I don't know, I just, something felt off. So I got on there and that's when I started to see the reports that Roderick Toombs, better known as Rowdy Roddy Piper, had passed away from cardiac arrest at the age of 61. Tough stretch of time here for wrestling fans over the past few years. I mean, obviously, uh, this is the second big loss of a major star. When you look back at the passing a few weeks ago of the American Dween Dusty Wodes, you know, but other big names like last year, the Ultimate Warrior on the heels of his great weekend at WrestleMania 30, going back a few years before that, the Macho Man Randy Savage, and obviously other guys throughout the years too. It's just a shame. You know, unfortunately, death is a reality. It is a part of life. And sometimes it's not ours to question the hand that we are ultimately dealt. But, you know, I've seen all the people and what they've had to say about Roddy Piper, his career and his legacy via social media and the Internet today. Seeing people talk about his greatness, his impact on the business, his legacy uh, what they'll remember him for and what they remember him as. And I decided I was going to come on here and give you my thoughts on the lifetime's career of the great Rowdy Roddy Piper. Now, when you look at his career path, he, it was very, very unlikely. Here's a kid from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, who grew up in a youth hostel, who broke into the professional wrestling business at the age of 14. Now, think about that for a second. Think about that. He broke into the wrestling business at age 14. 14! I mean, in a lot of ways, you could literally say the guy had just started having wet dreams and he was preparing for a life, a career in professional wrestling, in a man's world, in a man's business. Here's this 14-year-old kid going into really hostile territory in an entirely different era and time in the wrestling business. At 14 years old, his first ever match at 15 years of age came against that big freaking brute, Larry the Axe Hennig. Imagine having to stare down that big gorilla. You don't even know what the hell is happening. You don't even know how real it is or not real it is. And here comes Larry Hennig in Winnipeg, your first ever match. You know, so Roddy Roddy Piper, when people talk about paying their dues, this is a guy that paid dues throughout the early portion of his life, growing up in a youth hostel, going into the wrestling business at the age of 14, spending years in the territories, uh, being a jobber for the AWA and in other territories as well. You know, before he finally got his chance, finally got his break under the labels in NWA Hollywood, you know, then you look at his classic time, the way I look at it, classic time in San Francisco, but especially in Los Angeles. That's where it really started to come together for this little kid that in his first real appearance, he was called Roddy the Piper, and the fans apparently didn't understand, and they called him Roddy Piper, and the name stuck. His feud with the Guerreros is legendary. Then he goes on to Portland and Don Owens territory, and he does some great stuff there, especially with Playboy Buddy Rose. And then we're talking about he goes to Georgia Championship Wrestling in the Mid-Atlantic territory, and we still talk about things that he did during those times. This is a guy that was able, through those territorial days of the mid to late 70s and the early 80s, go into different territories, figure out who he was as a performer, figure out his character, practice his craft, ply his trade, figure out what worked, what didn't, how he could play the different audiences. So by the time it was time for him to go to the big show in town, the WWF, in late 1983, early 1984, this guy was ready. And when you talk about Roddy Piper and his impact on the WWF, it cannot be 
understated just how important and significant of a figure he was during the WWF's national and international expansion of the mid and late 1980s. You look back on that period, especially the age between 84 and 87. Yes, we talk about Hogan, and as we should, and we talk about Andre the Giant, and again, as we should, and we'll talk about other people like the Macho Man Randy Savage and Jake the Snake Roberts, and again, as we should. But you think about how many big moments happened that Roddy Piper was directly involved in. I mean, you look back to his feud with Superfly Jimmy Snooker, hitting him over the head with the coconut in Piper's pit. You're talking about the whole rock and wrestling connection, and you're talking about what really made that go, in my opinion, was Rowdy Roddy Piper. As you're starting to get involved with what Cindy Lauper is doing, you're starting to get a, develop a relationship with MTV, you're starting to get some real serious mainstream exposure, you're really starting to become one of the it forms of entertainment in the 1980s. There's Rowdy Roddy Piper engaging, enraging, and offending everybody. And people are paying attention. They're gluing into their televisions. They're parting with their money to go to the arenas to see Roddy Piper get his ass kicked. You look at, in the build-up to WrestleMania 1, a show that's often forgotten, is the war to settle the score. Here's the WWF on MTV, and the main event is Roddy Roddy Piper versus Hulk Hogan for the WWF Championship. And it was about more than just that, though. You know, now you've got Cindy Lauper involved in... You know, she's sitting there grabbing onto his legs. You've got all of this, you know, going back a little bit before that when Roddy Roddy Piper is smashing the gold record over Captain Lou's head. But then you get Mr. T involved, and you're off to the races with WrestleMania 1. When Vince McMahon talks about how big of a risk WrestleMania 1 was, yeah, it was a huge risk. He took somebody else's idea and Dusty Rhodes and Starcade and tried to make his own thing out of it, and he did to his credit and his success. He did with WrestleMania. But that first one, you know, there was no guarantee. If it didn't work, it could have spelled disaster and maybe could have potentially spelled the end of the WWF and their expansion and, frankly, them as a company. But you look at WrestleMania 1 and WrestleMania 2, and in a lot of ways, those two events were built off of, in part, Roddy Roddy Piper and his ability to generate heat, his ability to get himself over, his ability to talk people into the arenas, his ability to talk people into going to closed circuit venues to be able to watch these shows. And I think what oftentimes needs to be said is that when we talk about WrestleMania 1, you've heard the whole thing about who was really the most responsible for drawing WrestleMania 1. Was it Vince McMahon? Was it Hulk Hogan? Or was it Roddy Roddy Piper? And everybody has their own opinions on this. And I'll say this, Vince obviously had a lot to do with it, especially with bringing in the Billy Martins, the Liberacci's, the Muhammad Ali's, and so on and so forth. Now, a lot of that was Vince. A lot of that was Hogan, too. I mean, he was a supernova. He was white hot. When you talk about white hot in professional wrestling, it doesn't get much white hotter than Hulk Hogan in the 1980s. But at the end of the day, the feud that really set the tone for WrestleMania 1, and frankly, WrestleMania 2 as well, the feud that got the most mainstream eyeballs on the WWF product at a time where they critically needed it as they were beginning that national and international expansion was Rowdy Roddy Piper versus Mr. T, period. Yes, he was associated with Hulk Hogan. Hulk Hogan was a key big part of that. But at the end of the day... The major appeal of WrestleMania 1 was not seeing Roddy Roddy Piper versus Hulk Hogan and seeing Hulk Hogan kick the shit out of Roddy Roddy Piper. It was seeing Mr. T be able to get his hands on and potentially, hopefully, be able to kick the shit out of Roddy Roddy Piper. It was Piper and his ability to get Mr. T over. It was Piper and his ability to get himself over. It was... Piper in his ability to generate the type of heel heat that generates into ticket sales and money and closed circuit views that helped the WWF launch into an entirely different stratosphere at a perfect time for the company. WrestleMania 1 and WrestleMania 2 were successful events in no small part due to Rowdy Roddy Piper. And, you know, you look at it, too, his time in WWF. You look at the build-up to WrestleMania 3, and we talk about 
Andre the Giant versus Hulk Hogan main eventing in front of 93,173 people to Pontiac Silverdome. And that's all fine and good. But when it came time to really get Andre and Hogan into motion, when it came time to really set up this irresistible force versus immovable object match at WrestleMania 3, who did Vince McMahon turn to? He turned to Roddy Roddy Piper in Piper's Pit. You throw in just the body venture, you throw in Bobby the Brain Heenan, and you've got magic. But at the end of the day, where did all of this happen? Where did the slow turn of Andre come into play? Where did Andre showing up with Bobby the Brain Heenan come into play? Where did Andre ultimately rip the crucifix off of Hogan and leaving Hogan with a little bit of a nail mark to where he's bleeding? And the challenge was ultimately issued and the challenge was ultimately accepted for WrestleMania 3. It was in Piper's pit with Rowdy Roddy Piper. And then even when you get to WrestleMania 3, you know, by that time, Roddy Roddy Piper had gone away in 86 for a little while, came back, and he was a fan favorite. He was going to have his retirement match, the haircut match with Adrian Adonis, which is a great memory for me in its own right. It wasn't a great kind of visual showcase or wrestling masterpiece or anything like that, but it meant something to a lot of people. And a lot of people really respected and admired Roddy Roddy Piper, and they didn't want to see him go. So to be able to see him have this big moment in front of so many people is something that I still look back on very fondly. And even when you look at that, the WWF was getting ready to launch a new character called Brutus the Barber Beefcake, turning him from heel to babyface. They were able to associate him in that match with the runout to cut out Adrian Adonis' hair with Roddy Roddy Piper to where Beefcake was able to have himself a nice run in the late 80s and early 90s. You look at WrestleMania 5, his segment with Morton Downey Jr., one of the great talkers and shock talkers, if you will, of the 1980s. You look at WrestleMania 8 and that classic Intercontinental Championship match that he had with Bret the Hitman Hart. WrestleMania 12, who could ever freaking forget the Hollywood backlot brawl with Goldust. I mean, what a great career that spans, you know, well over a decade in Bit different bits and pieces. And I always think about Piper as a commentator, too. One of those moments we talk about, Survivor Series 1990, the debut of The Undertaker, but also the freaking gobbledygooker. And one of my most memorable Survivor Series moments ever is not just the debut of the gobbledygooker, but it's Roddy Roddy Piper's reaction. Where <laughs> Basically like that for several minutes. When I go back and watch that 25 years later, my God, 25 years later now, that's one of those things that I always look forward to. I just can't wait for that moment where the big reveal happens and Gorilla tries to say something and Piper just freaking explodes. You know, but you look at Piper too. Here's a guy that was more than just a wrestler. He was Hollywood. You know, people still talk about his movie, They Live, and that was almost 30 years ago. He made so many different movies and television appearances over the years. Hell, I remember watching him as a teenager on Walker, Texas Ranger. You know, but also a family man. Seemed to be a loving and devoted husband and father of four kids. You know, he had a hell of a life. He had a hell of a run, that's for damn sure. A life and a run that a lot of us could only aspire and hope to have. But when it comes to talking about Roddy Roddy Piper's legacy... What is his legacy? You know, I look at Piper and I start off with the wrestling component, if you will. And let's talk about the fact that we're talking about one of the greatest talkers in the history of the business, bar none. When people talk about great mouthpieces, great stick workers, the best on the mic of all time, you'll see different configurations of who goes in the top five or who goes in the top ten. But one name that's almost pretty much consistent all across the board in anybody's list that knows anything at all about the history of professional wrestling is Rowdy Roddy Piper. And oftentimes he's listed as 1A, 1B, or number one or number two amongst the greatest talkers of all time in a business that has had many great Mike men over the years. He's the creme de la creme. He is the cream of the crop, if you will. And we still view him that way all these years later after the peak years of his career. He had the ability to engage the audience, enrage the audience, offend the audience. But what I always really liked about Piper was he had an ability 
to get himself and his opponent over in the way that needed to happen, in large part because he could take an issue, as Jim Ross would say so eloquently, and he had the ability to make it personal. And it was so important. You see that now in today's business where so often it's just, it's this guy, it's this guy. And you don't really see a whole lot of reason for these guys to be fighting. You don't see a whole lot of reason to care about why they're fighting. Almost every single time Piper did something, it meant something. Almost every single time he had a feud with somebody, it felt personal. It felt real. And it really translated so well. You look at Roddy Piper too, and we're talking about a guy in terms of his mouthpiece, in terms of of what he said on the microphone, we still quote him to this day. Just when they think they have all the answers, I change the questions. You know, we talk about, you do not throw rocks at a man with a machine gun. You know, to this day, people still quote Roddy Roddy Piper. Many people, in fact, that never saw Roddy Roddy Piper in the 1980s because, frankly, they weren't even freaking born. They still quote Roddy Roddy Piper and people that watched him for years and know who he was and what he represented and how great he was still quote him to this day. But you look about Piper's career and you talk about his legacy and when you really think about it, he has so many things that we can remember all of these years later. Many people, especially in the L.A. area that grew up during that era, during that time, or even or the kids of people that watched wrestling during that time period of the late 70s, will still talk about his feud with the Guerrero family, talking about all the crap he used to say about the Mexican community, talking about how he was sorry, how he was going to sit there and play the Mexican National Anthem on the bagpipes, and instead he plays La Cucaracha. He'd sit there and walk around wearing his Conqueror of the Guerrero shirt. I mean, people still talk about that in that area almost 40 years later. When we think about Starcade 83 and the success of that show was and how much we look back on that show with reverence and admiration. And yeah, that was the flair for the gold and, you know, Ric Flair won the belt from Harley Race. But the match we really remember is Greg the Hammer Valentine versus Roddy Roddy Piper in the dog collar match. That's the one we remember over 30 years later. Over 30 years later, we still remember his Piper's Pit segment where he smashed the coconut on the back of Superfly Jimmy Snooka's head. Over 30 years later, we still remember his Piper's Pit segment with, of all people, Frankie Frickin' Williams from Columbus, Ohio. Over 30 years later, we still remember Piper's Pit segments. We remember the rock and wrestling connection where he was such a critical and key component of that and made that whole engine go because he was the one that was representing this way of thinking, you know, as Hulk Hogan was aligned with this new modern kind of way of thinking with Cindy Lauper and David Wolf and what have you. Here comes Roddy Roddy Piper. You got Captain Lou thrown in the mix. He's smashing the gold record over freaking Captain Lou. He's calling out Mr. T, 18 Mr. T, Clubber Lang Rocky 3 Mr. T. This mother humper was hot in the 80s. You want to talk about white hot, Mr. T, white hot, Hulk Hogan, white hot. And here's freaking Roddy Roddy Piper. In that period of time, when it comes to heels, there have been few other that have been as white hot as he was during that time frame. And we still talk about that feud with Mr. T, frankly, 30 years after the fact. WrestleMania 1 and WrestleMania 2, both events were built off of the backs in large part of Roddy Roddy Piper and his feud with Mr. T, period. Again, we still talk about Andre ripping the crucifix off of Hogan, aligning himself with Bobby Heaton, and challenging Hogan to the title match at WrestleMania 3, and Hogan accepting. That was in Piper's pit. When Piper is sitting there and saying, hey, man, you're, you're bleeding. You're bleeding, man. Are you going to answer the challenge, yes or no? Almost 30 years later, we still talk about that. We still remember that. We still remember his, his uh, whatever you want to call it, his... Uh, his two-face at WrestleMania 6. We still remember it 25 years later. We think back to his classic Intercontinental Championship match with Bret Hart at WrestleMania 8 when the Intercontinental title mattered and the champions mattered. And this was at a time where Bret Hart needed that type of rub and he needed that spotlight and he got it from his friend and Roddy Roddy Piper. Over 23 years later, we still talk about it. 
I know I most certainly am not the only one about 20 years later that still loves to talk about that Hollywood backlot brawl at WrestleMania 12 with Goldust. I'm going to make a man out of him. <laughs> the guy wearing a kilt, playing the bagpipes, <laughs> is going to make a man out of Goldust. And he did, by God, he did. <laughs> that footage looks eerily familiar. The white fucking Ford Bronco. We still talk about it. We still talk about him wearing kilts, the bagpipes, and having a whole entourage of bagpipe players come out with him in his entrances. And you think about it this way. You want to talk about Piper's legacy. Whenever you see a kilt, you don't think about Mel Gibson and Braveheart. You think about Roddy Roddy Piper. That's wrestling fans, and frankly, I'm not a, a lot of non-wrestling fans or former wrestling fans. They think about Roddy Roddy Piper. And you know damn good and well, anytime you ever go anywhere and you hear somebody play the bagpipes, you instantly think in the back of your head first, oh my God, is Roddy Roddy Piper freaking here? But you ultimately come back to thinking about who? Rowdy Rowdy Piper. Just think about that for a second. You know, we think about all these greats and all these icons and all these legends. And I think in part, we don't give Piper enough due for just how good he was and just how important and significant he was and just how impactful he was and how much he meant both to the business and in particular the WWF at a time where they really, really needed somebody like him. I think, frankly, in a lot of ways, we always admire him, we respect him, you know, but we don't give him the due, frankly, that he deserves. We don't show him the love and respect that he, frankly, deserves. We show it to a degree, but I don't even think it resonates until you really start to sit down and really start to think about it, you know, just how great his career was and just how many things from his career you still remember 20, 30, damn near 40 years later. But he just wasn't one of the greatest wrestlers of all time, one of the greatest mouthpieces of all time, one of the greatest villains of all time. He was more than that. This is a guy that opened up doors for others. You know, when we talk about WWE being able to do WWE studios, uh, WWE wrestlers over the years being able to go do movies, both with the studios and outside projects as well. You know, Roddy Roddy Piper was a part of that along with Hogan and along with others. That helped open those doors and opportunities for professional wrestlers. And again, something I don't think Roddy Roddy Piper gets the respect that he deserves for doing. Again, a great husband from everything we've ever heard. A great father, a great family man. You know, not a perfect man, sure, and he had his flaws. There were times where some of the things he said I thought were a little bit on the offensive side. But I respect a man that takes care of his priorities and his responsibilities. And at the end of the day, your ultimate responsibility is to take care of your family, you know, however you can. And clearly he did a great job of that. You don't hear about all these extramarital affairs throughout his life. You don't sit there and hear about this, his kids doing this or his kids doing that. These are kids that are chasing their dreams. They're going to school. Colt has followed in his footsteps going into the professional wrestling business. In a lot of ways, you look at Piper, and he's a man's man. I mean, this was a guy that had guts. This was a guy that had balls. When Vince talked about balls the size of grapefruits. Here's Roddy Roddy Piper, a guy of all of maybe, what, 6 foot, 225, 230 pounds, that's going after you know big fucking heavyweights like Hulk Hogan, who's sitting there talking about how much of a man he is, questioning other people's manhood, and talking shit about other people while he's wearing a freaking skeleton. I'm talking like this. He's wearing a kill. He's basically wearing a skirt. No matter how you want to call it. He's basically wearing a skirt. Call himself the hot rod. I'm telling everybody how much of a man he is. And by God you believed it. Because he was. A lot of the things that he did over the years. Sometimes you liked him. Sometimes you really didn't. But what really made him such a respectable and admired figure as his career progressed was the fact that he had courage. He was willing to take chances. He was willing to roll the dice. And in an almost kind of entrepreneurial type of way, something that we really aspire to, but a lot of us, frankly, lack the courage, conviction, and self-belief to be able to do. Roddy Roddy Piper had courage, conviction, and self-belief in great abundance. Something I wish I frankly had more of in my life.
When I look at somebody in a lot of ways as a man's man, I look at somebody like a Roddy Roddy Piper. And more than that, too, you're talking about a former cancer survivor with his Hodgkin's lymphoma. I mean, he had a bad car accident before that. I mean, this is a guy you're talking about, you know, all those years of wear and tear on his body. He grew up in a freaking youth hostel. He broke into the wrestling business at 14 years of age. He freaking had his eardrum shattered in that dog collar ma match by Greg the Hammer Valentine where he lost 50% of his hearing in that ear. And at one point in time, he was concerned about whether or not he was going to be able to ever get his equilibrium back to be able to wrestle ever again to go on to be a guy that was a part of such a key and critical period of time in both the WWF and in the wrestling business's history and be a part of so many great moments and events throughout his career that he was a pivotal key signature part of all the while throughout his life still being able to be a husband and a father to be able to do these other things do all this work in TV and in movies be able to fight cancer like he did all to sit there and basically pass away in his sleep due to cardiac arrest at the age of 61. Like I said, it, it's hard for me as a fan because I look at a guy that I admired and respected tremendously. The wrestling business is a business that I love. It's in my blood. No matter how much I try to sit there and bloodlet the hell out of it. I just can't bloodlet it out. And it's because of people like Piper that I am the way that I am. And he's a part of my identity, just like Dusty Rhodes, just like the Ultimate Warrior, just like the Macho Man Randy Savage, just like Andre the Giant, just like people that are still with us, guys like Jake the Snake Roberts and guys like Hulk Hogan. And, you know, it's it, it makes me think sometimes. It's like, you know, sometimes we sit there as fans and we talk about, well, we don't want to see these fossils. We don't want to see these old guys. They're past their prime. They've had their time. Yeah, maybe that's true, but maybe knowing how it is as wrestling fans, knowing the history of these guys that have sacrificed so much to make their money and make their living and become stars in the professional wrestling business, maybe we should be happy to see them while we still can. And again, it's just another reminder that life is precious and we don't know how much of it we got. We don't know when it's going to be taken from us. We know it will be at some point. We just don't know when. And I have to say is that if I could live a life even a quarter or a tenth of the way as fulfilling as Roddy Roddy Piper was able to do, I'd go to my grave a very, very happy man indeed. You know, so while I'm sad that Roddy Piper has passed away, you know, I still, as you can see, have a smile on my face because... You know, I think about all the good things. I think about all the positive memories that I have. And I think back on one of the truly great uh, hit villains in the history of professional wrestling, one of the truly great characters in the history of professional wrestling. When you think of great heels in professional wrestling history, the creme de la creme to me is Gorgeous George, Vince McMahon, both in, in the ring and behind the scenes. And then I look at somebody like a Roddy Roddy Piper. Maybe you'll throw in somebody like a Flassy Freddy Blassie too. I'll go with that. Bobby the Brain Heenan as a heel manager and commentator. I could go with that. But damn, man. Right at the top of that list to me has to be Roddy Roddy Piper. It really does. So, you know, the best thing I could say to quote Roddy Piper, as so many people have done today and so many people have done for years and frankly will continue to do whether or not they even realize they're quoting the man or not. I will borrow from they live. I have. <laughs> I am here to kick ass and chew bubblegum, and I am all out of bubblegum. Well, Roddy Roddy Piper took that bubblegum of life, chewed the shit out of it for 61 years. He kicked ass, and now we went to the big main event in the sky. Now, what a main event that's going to be. I could only imagine at the pearly gates, the American Dream Dusty Rhodes saying, baby, we needed a villain. It's going to be you versus me, baby. And we're going to have run-ins by the Macho Mans and the Ultimate Warriors. And it's going to be an extravaganza. It's going to be a spectacle. We're going to call it the Great Heaven Bass, baby. Roddy Roddy Piper. Thank you for the memories.
my condolences and my sympathies to uh, Roddy's family. Just know that the man is loved, respected, and admired by millions, as I'm sure you have already known. And if you didn't know, you're finding out now. It's just sad that, you know, again, another part of my childhood gone too soon. Love you, Roddy. <laughs> I hope you went up to heaven and you said, if there is such a place, and said, ah, just when you think you've got all the answers, I change the questions. <laughs>